headquarters of Telesio English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South, and I am Sweeney Gray. Brazil's vice presidential candidate Fernando Haddad has arrived to the Workers' Party's extraordinary meeting in Curitiba. Haddad previously visited former president Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva in prison. The PT could name him as the presidential candidate, replacing Lula. The electoral court rejected Lula's request for an extension of the deadline to name his replacement for the presidential run. The Workers' Party has until 7 p.m. local time this Tuesday to name a substitute camp candidate. Meanwhile, presidential candidate Jair Bolsonaro needs further surgery after last week's knife attack. Bolsonaro was stabbed during a political rally and isn't likely to resume campaigning. Venezuela's foreign minister Jorge Ariasa has condemned the siege against Venezuela at the UN Human Rights Commission in Geneva. He said the measures taken by the US and the European Union have promoted a financial blockade. Ariasa also met with the new UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Misha Bachelet, to discuss the Venezuelan mi to discuss Venezuelan migration in the region. He asked the Human Rights Council to be fairer in their rulings. Tiene que haber mecanismos. What I ask of the Council was that, as part of the universal system for the protection of human rights, there have to be mechanisms to first condemn and then neutralize the sort of suppressive measures that have been used against Venezuela, Cuba, or any other country around the world. A single country's decisions cannot be used to bend the will or sovereignty of a nation. We have to respect the basic rights of nations, sovereignty, self-determination, non-interference. These rights must be guaranteed for everyone. We have to stand together against isolationism. There's an ongoing fight between unity and isolationism, as U.S. President Donald Trump has even withdrawn from the Human Rights Council and has shown interest in withdrawing from all international forums and organizations. He stands against what we believe here, that through international bodies we can better cooperate and move forward, that only together can we put an end to aggressions and guarantee peace, safety and prosperity around the world. A march against U.S. attempts at intervention is planned in Venezuela for Tuesday. This comes after the New York Times reported U.S. high officials allegedly met with members of the Venezuelan army to oust President Maduro. The report says the conversations between the coup plotters began in August 2017. Minister of Communication Jorge Rodriguez also denounced the intervention attempt. We now have proof. How many times has President Nicolás Maduro and previously President Hugo Chávez, how many times did they denounce the intervention as brutal, criminal action of the imperial factors against Venezuela? Rodriguez also said the government is preparing an international action to protect Venezuelan migrants. We are preparing an international action aimed mainly at three events that are already fully demonstrated. One is slave labor, two, xenophobia and hate crimes, and three, brutal abuse against Venezuelan women and children. President Nicolas Maduro has announced his government will sue Colombia. He wants compensation for the social support Venezuela has provided to over 5 million Colombian migrants. Maduro has also condemned the xenophobic campaigns against Venezuelan migrants throughout Latin America. I have approved this idea of putting forth an internal demand to request compensation for the Colombian government for the 5.6 million of Colombians who are living here. 45 years after the military coup of Augusto Pinochet, Chile still remembers the horrors of that day and the 17 years of the regime that followed. Every September 11, Chile awakens more silent than usual, with the feeling that no matter how much time has passed, things are still not right. Today is the anniversary of the military coup which put an end to democracy. I'm too young to give an informed opinion if the actions of that day were justified. But I believe that bombing the presidential palace is not the way to defend our nation. There were so many detained, so many disappeared and tortured. Their family members joined the crowd of mourners. I don't have a name for it. It was painful. I would be waiting to buy bread, and members of the military would attack us. There are so many more things not worth remembering. What does today signify for you? Pain.
My dad was taken to the National Stadium, where so many people were killed. Was your dad one of the men disappeared? Yes, I still don't know where he is. This is why memory matters, reconstructing the events of that day over and over again. Projects like Timeless Pictures represent this idea by merging historical pictures with current image. Many initiatives are defying difference and impunity traits. Words that are becoming more frequent following the recent freeing of members of the Pinochet administration accused of murder and torture. Mireya and her brother's story are part of one of the most heartbreaking projects, a documentary that reconstructs his final moments as a prisoner in Dawson Island. Our conviction remains strong despite the passage of time. Time will not lead to forgetting. It will only lead to the strengthening of our will for truth and justice for the victims. Another art project being held this year is the digital recreation of the faces of those who were lost so their families may see how they could have aged. This is what they would look like today, they say, in between laughter and tears. We are calling out impunity. There are those who walk away free, free of our suffering, free of losing loved ones. That can no longer be. My brother will never come back. Projects like this not only reveal the link families have with their lost loved ones, but the link a nation has with its past. Authorities and institutions are also commemorating the coup. President Sebastian Pinera addressed the nation and said the country has to learn from past mistakes and look to the future. A group in London has also commemorated the coup in Chile with embroidery patchworks known as aparias. They paid tribute to those who disappeared. Pablo Navarrete reports from London. <laughs> Every Friday since February of this year, a group of Chileans, many of whom were political prisoners under the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet, along with British people and others, come together to embroider brightly coloured patchworks known as arpilleras to honour the memory of the disappeared of the Pinochet dictatorship. In this group, what we are trying to do is to embroider arpilleras with memories or with the faces of the disappeared and executed after Pinochet's coup in Chile. The group is called Embroidering Memory, and Jimena Pardo, one of the group's founders, is herself the daughter of former Chilean political prisoners who were forced to leave the country and arrived in the UK as political refugees. This is an embroidery that my mother made when she was detained in Three Alamos Torture Center. The design is from her friend Helena Zarur. Helena Zarur is a victim of the dictatorship. As word of the group's work has spread, they have been contacted by people from around the world offering arpilleras for the project. A number of non-Chilean Latin Americans also take part supporting the construction of collective memory. As in Mexico and many parts of Latin America where there have been disappearances, I feel it is important to support projects of the disappeared anywhere in the world. And precisely, this way of remembering through embroidery is something that is also done a lot in Mexico, and that is like a form of transnational memory. September 11th marks the 45th anniversary of the Pinochet coup that overthrew Salvador Allende's democratically elected government. On this day, the group will march from the centre of London with their arpilleras to the Chilean embassy in London to attend a vigil for the victims of the dictatorship. From London, Jimena, Sara and the rest of the members of the Embroidering Memory Project have contributed to rescuing the memory of the victims of Chile's dictatorship. Pablo Navarrete, Telesur, London. Nicaragua's army is celebrating its 39th anniversary. At the main ceremony, President Daniel Ortega handed over command of the police to Francisco Diaz. Ortega also paid tribute to the officers killed during the protests that, have take, that took over the country since April. The police is there to serve all Nicaraguans, regardless of the political, ideological and religious thinking of Nicaraguan families, who demand police attention and protection. We never attacked anyone. We made legitimate use of force, according to our constitutional power, to guarantee the life, physical integrity, and property of individuals, families, and communities. 
We'll take a short break now. More news in a minute. cultural diversity that defines our South American essence. Come along to find out the story behind these personalities, traditions, and artistic expressions that unite us as a whole. Real Lives. Saturdays, only on Telesur. Welcome back. Workers in Costa Rica continue their week of protests. Thousands of workers from the public services have marched in the capital, San Jose, to support the open-ended strike that began on Monday. They are angry about the government's fiscal reform. Workers say it will affect the most vulnerable. They also believe the new measures won't help the country's economy. They shouldn't raise the basic needs products by 1% because there are people in this country in extreme poverty. And the only thing it will do is to make the citizen who does not have to eat suffer more. This is a movement that continues. It is a movement of an indefinite nature and tomorrow we will be in the streets again. Panama and Colombia have announced a roadmap to solve their bilateral trade conflict. The announcement was made by President Juan Carlos Varela and Ivan Duque after their meeting in Panama City. This comes after businessmen in Panama asked for sanctions against Colombia. They are angry about the tariffs imposed by Colombia on Panamanian products. The two countries also discuss cooperation in the fight against drug trafficking. I believe that having achieved a frank conversation allows us to establish a roadmap with our ministries of finance and trade, and that in the coming months we are announcing good news for our two countries. We have instructed the highest authorities, the Chancellor, the Minister of Commerce, the Minister of Economy and Finance of both countries, so that, as soon as possible, they seek understanding mechanism and establish a plan of action so that the matters where we have differences can be resolved bilaterally. Colombians are expressing their discontent with the policies of Ivan Duque's government. While there is no budget for education, pensions or public health, the government has announced tax cuts for companies. The increase in value-added tax for basic products was one of the deficit-reducing policies Minister Alberto Carrasquilla announced. I hope that they don't increase taxes on vegetables or rice. We are poor and we can't afford that for our whole family. They will affect vulnerable families if he adds taxes to things that didn't have them before. This would harm thousands of campesinos who work hard every day to sell their products. It would also hurt millions of Colombians without enough income to even pay these extra taxes. People won't buy fruits and vegetables anymore if VAT increase. Citizens say it is unacceptable that taxes are being lowered for entrepreneurs. At the same time, the government announced there is neither a budget for education nor health subsidies. No doubt the poor would be the hardest hit. They want to increase taxes for the middle class, and as Carrasquilla announced, on basic products. This means that they will make the workers pay for this millionaire bill. This will surely increase poverty. Some analysts say Alberto Carrasquilla represents the interest of Colombians' neoliberalism. He privatized different companies during his time as minister under Alvaro Uribe's government. 
This man is used to working for capitalism, against the workers. Everything he does worsens inequality. He will always support these kinds of measures. Social investment will be affected. However, wars surely won't. And big companies' budgets will remain unaffected. They won't touch Colombia's business sector. They also won't touch the riches of the Artila Lule or Sarmiento Angulo families. They protect the rich. Different social sectors say Duque's right-wing policies only serve to increase inequality and poverty. That's why they will take to the streets to protest the tax reform proposed by the National Treasury Minister. Argentina's Congress is about to debate whether to approve the latest budget. Our correspondent, Egaro Esteban, explains. It's a busy week for Macri. He has to keep markets at ease. And now he has to face the debate on the budget that will take place in Congress in the coming days. He's been meeting with governors to obtain their support for this debate. Now he also has to fight the general strike called for on September 25th. He is trying to negotiate an agreement with some of the workers' unions that will take part. The state workers' union will protest the reduction of 23 ministries that have become 10. They also say they expect 37,000 state workers to be laid off due to the austerity policies by the end of the year. On top of that, teachers have also organized a general strike. It's turning out to be a crucial week for Argentinians. More than one million people have been evacuated from the east coast of the United States as Hurricane Florence is approaching. The Category 4 storm is said to be the most powerful to menace the region in nearly 30 years. Authorities have warned of torrential rains and flooding across several states. Meanwhile, Isaac still poses a threat to some Caribbean islands. A hurricane watch has been issued for Guadeloupe. Martinique and Dominica, and a tropical storm watch is in effect for Antigua and Barbuda and Montserrat. Additional watches could be issued for the remainder of the Leeward Islands later on Tuesday. The public debate over Cuba's new constitution continues. Our correspondent in Havana, Elian Fernandez, reports. Indeed, Cuba is now into the fifth week of the popular consultation on the new constitution, which was drafted by a commission of members of the National Assembly of Popular Power. They say it is a new modern constitution which brings up to date all the changes that have happened over the years. There are many discussions about the political model that the country should follow, and most of the opinions agree that socialism is the only available model. The debate is now open to all sectors of the population nationwide. An evangelical church bought the stadium of one of Peru's most important football teams and turned it into a symbol of the conservative movement. More in this report. This was the stadium of Club Alianza Lima. Today it is property of the Evangelic Church Aposento Alto. What are you expecting of this space from now on? Christ is alive, Christ is alive, Christ is alive. Alianza Lima is one of the two most important soccer teams in Peru. Their fans and leaders are not willing to lose part of their home, accusing the church of taking advantage of its political and economic power to buy the stadium. This is an abuse. This is the home of the people. This is the home of Alianza Lima. They can't invade this space in the name of religion. It is like my house and heart are staying. This hurts me. Some evangelic churches have bought important coliseums, movie theaters, and other buildings as well. This is not about them getting a bigger space for the congregation. This shows how powerful and influential they are. They don't choose just any place. Researcher Juan Fonseca says churches ally with conservative parties. They use their influences and millionaire resources to impose their dogmas against women's rights, the LGBTI community, or the gender equality on education. Their career in politics follows the idea that the country has to be submitted to their rules, to their norms. They think they are right. This comes from their religious thinking. It's what some analysts call fundamentalism. Agua Viva is one of the churches investigated for money laundering. Currently, churches are exempt for paid taxes and their resources are not being audited.
Work continues in Rio's National Museum to recover its artifacts a week after a devastating fire. The priority is to secure the building and start the long and meticulous work of saving what remains of their collection. But experts are afraid most of them are already lost. One of the museum's directors lamented the lack of resources given to the institution. The resources of the administration of the Museum for Emergencies work renovations were absolutely insufficient. It was only enough to buy light bulbs and toilet paper. That's all we could buy. It's been almost a year since the earthquake that shattered, since the earthquake that shattered Mexico City. Pablo Perez has an update. When the earthquake alarm goes off, the response is immediate. The students at this college instantly abandon their classrooms and follow instructions to evacuate. Experts from a research institute say such training saved lives during the September 19th earthquake. That very same day, there was a drill hours earlier, which meant people were very aware of what they should do if there was an earthquake. At this forum, 19S, Mexico, 365 days after the earthquake, experts from different fields talk about the effects of the quake. For this psychologist, the constant drills do save lives, but they ignore the emotional harm that may be caused. We begin to think of it as something natural. Oh yeah, the alarm went off. And we evacuate the area with our phone in our hands, but we no longer consider it serious. It becomes an ordinary, everyday part of life. And it should not be like that. Another big impact is the visible damage caused by the earthquakes across the city. Damage it will take a lot of time to repair. And often, only by the efforts of the victims themselves. From what I've seen, it'll take around 10 years. While the neighbors come to an agreement, then the expert opinion is sought and the project is developed. It's very hard. 38 buildings in the city collapsed, but many of those still standing remain a possible danger. We've listed some of the buildings as uninhabitable, but there are still people living in them because they say they don't have anywhere to go. It's a very difficult problem. According to official figures, one year after the earthquake, there are still 349 buildings left to demolish, of the 411 that were damaged beyond repair. 983 buildings, like this one, are classified as high risk after the September quakes. The victims, like these residents of the Tlalpan housing estate, say it seems they are still not a priority for the government. Peru has recovered a priceless pre-Columbian gold mask from Germany. The repatriated 8th century treasure is a funeral mask from the Sikan culture. President Martin Vizcarra has hailed the country's battle to recover its cultural treasures. Germany returned it after 20 years of litigation. The Sikan culture lived in the north coast of Peru between around 750 and 1375. We'll take a short break now. World News is next. Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. Get access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South America on our screen and platform in English. A critical place committed to the truth to determine the major events that transform the world today. Mondays, only on Telesur.
Welcome back. The Palestinian Liberation Organization has submitted a new case of war crimes against Israel at the International Criminal Court. Forced displacement and ethnic cleansing have, have been cited in the file. Palestinian chief negotiator Sab Ekrat is urging the International Court to speed up the process into the investigation. The Israeli army planned to demolish a vi village in the occupied West Bank. The body of Kofi Annan returned to his native Ghana to mark the start of the official mourning for the former UN Secretary General. His body flew back from Geneva on Monday. His wife and children accompanied his corpse along with senior officials. Annan was a Nobel Peace Prize winner and the first UN leader from sub-Saharan Africa. He died last month at the age of 80. Several people have been killed and over a dozen are being treated for burns after a fire in a petrol station in Nigeria. An explosion started at the station in Nasakara State, reportedly due to a gas leak. President Mahmoud Buhari has offered his condolences to the victims and their families. And dozens of people have marched throughout Dallas downtown to protest the fatal shooting of a 26-year-old man, Botham Shem Jean. He was unarmed when a police officer shot him in his apartment. Amber Geiger says she mistook Jean's apartment for her own and thought that he was an intruder. The officer was arrested on a manslaughter charge, but a Texas grand jury could potentially charge her with murder. Jean's murder has sparked international outrage, especially in St. Lucia, where he was born. Um, and I'm here to say that we're going to support the family. I also want to thank the mayor, Mike Rollins, for reaching out to me um, and the empathy that he showed. And I was very encouraged by the words of the DA at the press conference this morning. And certainly my ambassador who is here um, will be working behind the scenes. Um, to give the family as much support as we possibly can and really hoping that the justice system um, takes the right course. People in New York have gathered to remember the 9-11 atrocities that targeted the United States. Roses were placed on ground zero to commemorate the men and women who died during the attack. Meanwhile, President Donald Trump traveled to Pennsylvania to pay his respects to those who perished on board Flight 93. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at telesiotv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesio English, I'm Sony Gray. Thank you so much for watching.